Our speaker tonight is Jim McFeeters, has been a volunteer with the Fairfax County CERT program since 2014. He's a CERT instructor and coordinates neighborhood CERT teams across Fairfax County. To encourage new graduates to transition from basic CERT students to involved CERT participants, he envisioned and created a CERT orientation class for new returning and transferring CERT volunteers. Retired, he draws upon his experiences during a Navy career, risk management consulting and advanced CERT training. He served as the damage control officer aboard an aircraft carrier and was the port evacuation officer in Subic Bay, Philippines during the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991. In addition to CERT, Jim enjoys his family, fly fishing and sailing. And with that, I turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this session. This is the second time we've offered this in, uh, in this CERTCon. Um, we thought that by offering up more than once, uh, it would give you the opportunity to take in more, um, a, a wider selection of offerings. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, I'm, this is going to be a, a long introduction in order to get get you in my mindset so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, we've all been there before. You do your last couple of sessions with your in your CERT program. You're coming up on graduation. You've got your backpack stuffed with um, stop the bleed supplies and, and bandaging and, and such. You're all excited. You go through the exercise. It's a successful exercise and you get your certificate. And so now what? What do you do now? Um, I was in that situation. I've talked to a number of my CERT colleagues who have been in that situation. Um, what, what do we do with our newly graduated CERTs and not just next week or next month, but a year from now or three years from now? How do we get the most from your energy and your enthusiasm and your interest that best benefits the, uh, the community at large, your community? Um, so what I'm trying to do here is give you ideas for yourself and for others about how you can transfer these skills and attitudes from the classroom into your community. Also, how can your interest, your professional skill sets, how can they uh, benefit your, your mun mun municipalities, your counties, CERT programs, Pro programmatically, the CERT program in general. So well beyond your cul-de-sac, well beyond your apartment building, what can you do for your CERT program? And that's what I uh, would want to try to get through tonight. For the session goals, I want to really celebrate you. I mean that sincerely. I am so pleased that you gave of your time and energy to stick with the, with the CERT the basic CERT course, and for many of you have gone on to take other uh, continuing CERT uh, education classes, CCEs. Um, so this is an invitation for us tonight to drop the backpack and to have a conversation about what your scheme is for what you might do and how you might do it uh, in terms of growing your CERT skills and uh, contributing to the community after you graduate from CERT Basic. A disclaimer here, I promise you there is nothing new under the sun that I'm going to offer you tonight. Perhaps a different way of thinking about it, a different, uh, a, a systematic way to where you can inventory your skills and kind of chart a course for yourself going forward. Uh, there are many of these same ideas uh, that I'm going to talk about tonight come from, you can find them in how to be a more successful employee, uh, in, in management and performance uh, literature. There's no, again, I'm not claiming in any way that this is a, a, a new idea, a fresh idea. It is, it is something though that we can, if we stop and think about what we're trying to do, that maybe your CERT development can be a little more meaningful and a little more directed. So I want to offer you tonight a systematic, a purposeful approach to how you envision and develop your CERT participation going forward. 
to understand where I'm coming from, uh, sort of uh, go back and take a look at where, where my experience is. Uh, I graduated from basic cert, cert in 2014. Um, in my life before CERT, I was professional instructor and facilitator. Um, I've been involved with CERT training ever since, assisting, instructing, uh, working on the curriculum. As a, as a CERT student, um, it, and from my time in the, in the Navy, uh, it was very much the same thing. A lot of the things that I've learned and believe in is uh, if we want to have a, if we want to get the best product, we need people thinking about what they're doing and why they're doing it. If you're going through training, how might you use this training? And I think that's, that's a question that is very uh, individualistic. Yeah, it's something that you need to customize for yourself. When, I, when I'm talking to, to folks about this, I refer back to the early 1900s Chicago Cubs baseball team. They had an infield uh, uh, shortstop, second base, first base, Tinkers, Evers, and Chance. And, and they those three ball players turned an amazing number of double plays. And people wanted to know how they did it. They did it because as they were going from town to town by train and all of the all of the travel in those days was by train, they would talk about situational, they would present each other with situational puzzles. Okay, so we're playing the Cardinals uh, next Wednesday and everybody's the regular lineup's gonna be on. So so-and-so and so-and-so gets on base and so-and-so comes to the plate. Now we know he likes to hit high and inside and so-and-so is pitching from our team. So. What's the likely pitch? Where is he likely to hit it? If it's an infielder, you know, if it's an infield and it goes over to the, to the left of the second baseman, how are we going to play that? And so they would talk it through. So when the actual event happened, and this was sort of a game amongst themselves. It was a way of knowing everything they could about every player. It was their profession. They, were, they took glee in it. And they thought it through. They worked it through over and over again. So when the actual hit took place. And on the second bounce, all three of them knew how that, how that play was going to evolve. And so the, the phrase for that was tinkers to Everest to chance. People thinking about doing a situational analysis, imagining it before it happens. Having graduated uh, and, and taught in the basic cert, I have a tremendous appreciation for the structure and the delivery. When I was sitting there in the, in the, in the uh, amphitheater listening to the, to the presentations, the question kept going through my mind, how am I going to use this? Now, I've, I'm a Fairfax County product, so how is Fairfax County going to call me out? Are they going to call me out? What will that look like? And I kept asking that question. I didn't, I didn't get what I felt was a satisfactory answer because in those days we weren't set up to actually activate the certs, certainly not the way we are now after a year of COVID. And my understanding is from the other jurisdictions as well um, that you also have had a, a tremendous learning curve based upon your participation in COVID. So I've been trying to answer that question uh, ever since. And and what I'm going to share with you tonight is kind of my take on the successful ways that I've seen on how you do that so that you get the most out of the time that you invested in going through basic cert. I'm going to ask you to consider three perspectives. Of that perspective of a beginner cert, of an intermediate cert, and an advanced cert. I think the um, adjectives there are pretty well self-explanatory, but they're also relative to your experiences. I'm gonna get into that in just a bit. But, you know, the beginner, right out of basic cert perhaps, or maybe a graduate of basic cert 10 years ago and with stale skills, something you're not so sure of it, feeling a little uneasy perhaps about coming back into the program. Maybe their skills need sharpening a bit. But the big thing is new, to, new, new feet on the ground, a lot of questions, not a whole lot of answers. How do you, in, how do you in, insert yourself into the program? 
The intermediate cert's been around for a while, a year or two maybe, has done some additional training, uh, kind of knows the people, knows who to call, but is still not ready to kind of step forward and carry the flag, maybe do the IC stuff. Um, and then the advanced, uh, we all know who those people are. They seem like they've been around forever. They were probably born certs. Um, they're the go-to people for answers. Um, those, are the, those are the folks. I suggest to you, or I propose to you that this material that we're gonna, that I'm gonna present tonight applies to all three levels that uh, for beginners and uh, right, right, on, right on through, and it's the way you digest that information uh, and use it. The, uh, excuse me, the, um, and, and I also find from my own experience that I can wear more than one hat at a time. That in some days I go into a brand new situation, I'm smart enough to keep my mouth shut and, and just listen and see what's going on. And for all intent and purposes, I'm a beginner. Um, then there's the, uh, later on I might be at the intermediate level and, and at another point in the day actually be the IC for something going on and people are coming to me for answers. So this is, a, this is kind of a relative ranking. So try and listen with all three hats on as you go, go through this. I'm also gonna ask you to imagine three applications so that as a beginner and intermediate and advanced, you're thinking about, I'd like you to think about, about how do you apply this CERT basic training to yourself, to yourself and your family, the individual. Remember who's the most important person here. We wanna make sure you're take, we're taking care of ourselves first. That's one of the more important mantras. How do you use your CERT skills with your neighborhood? And by neighborhood, I mean your immediate neighborhood, neighbors on both sides of you, the cul-de-sac, your homeowner association, maybe your community. How do you, how do you make your community a safer, better prepared place to live? And then the third perspective, the third application would be going back again to the CERT, your CERT program. Um, it's not everybody necessarily gets involved in that, but is there something that you're contributing at the programmatic level that, that makes things go easier, faster? And that could be bringing your professional skills to bear. I'm thinking right away of IT, we have IT professionals that are allowing us to do this cert con virtually that if it was left to me in my generation, ain't gonna happen. And so uh, we've got people with their professions that have just made a tremendous difference in our cert program and allowed us to do this cert con virtually. So if you would then imagine and you can make take notes or, or doodle on a on a three by three grid. Things that resonate with you, and how your you uh, what you're listening to at whatever level you think you're primarily operating at. What are some ideas and and taking down ideas and putting it in at the individual neighborhood or, or programmatic uh, level. The first thing, uh, so we, we, after all that stuff, I get down to, so what is, uh, what does happen after CERT basic? I mean, really, what, what, what goes on here? Remember, I confess to being a, a recovering consultant. So my standard answer is, it depends. You pay for a consultant, you're gonna get that. You're gonna, well, it depends. And it does, it depends on you. There's no single off the shelf best answer. You're gonna to have to customize this for yourself. And those are the best answers, the ones that you actually customize for yourself. So I'm, asking, I'm gonna ask you to do kind of a, per a personal situational assessment. You had a life before, before CERT. Hard to remember, hard to believe, but yes, it's true. You had a life before CERT. And what did that life involve? So what were your skills? What were your abilities? Uh, what were your passions? What did you bring, bring to the table? What in your first day of CERT, maybe going back to thinking about how you introduced yourself in class one 
when he went around and said, you know, I'm Bob Smith and I used to do whatever. Life experiences. Right now, well, so many of you have been through uh, disasters of one type or another. Flooding, tornadoes, hurricanes, very common. Think about the things that you've been through. Fires, a fire in the house, a fire in the neighborhood. What were those things like? What did you learn from them? What did you take away from them? Um, those are all very, very practical skills. If you're in management, you know, how does that go? If you're a supervisor of any type, what are the, what, what is your style and how do you get the most out of people? That's your style. It's different than my style in all probability. How are we successful? How have you been successful up to this point? Those are all important skills and they come into play, particularly when we talk about a leadership class, but that's part of it. That's one of the things that, we're, that, that are so important to you taking your cert knowledge, your passion, your, your skills into the community. Do you have any certifications? Um, it is very disconcerting to be a cert instructor and see a student show up with not a not with his first day with his cert pack very well fleshed out, as well as a, carrying a uh, a medical kit that he's cobbled together or she, and you know it is as they start going through it, it it seems that they could do open heart surgery from the stuff they've got in there. Why? Because they've been a corpsman, or they carry some sort of a a uh, medical degree or a medical experience or something. And they know from their other life experiences what they should have and they know what their qualifications are. So their qualifications are certainly much different than mine. And they're, they're driving in a different lane then. Do you have any hobbies that are applicable to CERT? And that could be any, right, one right off the top, a more obvious one might be ham radio. If, if that's your hobby, then there is absolutely uh, a card to be played from that, uh, from that ham deck uh, that will be of benefit to the CERT program in your CERT neighborhood. Have you thought about, have you taken the time to think about what are the CERT goals for myself? What do I want to do? Imagine yourself a year from now, uh, uh, two years from now, five years out. Uh, it's always very uh, heartening to have uh, a student come up towards the end of the class and ask you, um, you know, how do, what did you do to become an instructor? How do I get to be an instructor? Oh man, I can't set the hook fast enough on that one. You know, we, we've got a live one here and we're, we've got our next generation of instructor. Uh, so, uh, but, but frequently people are pretty well, pretty overwhelmed by this point and they don't always ask, but that person those people have obviously been thinking about how they can participate in the program. At whatever level you are now, um, beginner, intermediate, or advanced, and, and I understand that those might not be the best adjectives, but they're ones that I think that can be commonly understood. So at you, the particular level you are right now, what, what are you trying to achieve? What's, what's going on? Why are you attending CERTCON? What is it you're trying to come out with uh, for yourself, for your neighborhood and community, or for your program? So that, again, covers all three levels. You have to be realistic about your time availability and your family obligations. How much time do you actually have to give? You know, it doesn't do you or the program any good if you sign up for a lot of things and then find out that you're being constantly being taken away or you're not able to, um, to, to make your, your commitments. So be realistic and be realistic as you can and talk to the people involved. So for some cases, I'm a, I'm a team lead in my community. I've got team members, certs who are part of the, my Fairfax station, neighborhood team and they say okay Jim this is it you know I I want to do this that and the other thing 
but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be deployed for six months and I'm, I'm just not going to be here. So I'll let you know when I get back in. That's absolutely fine. That's wonderful. Uh, best of all possible things. Uh, he's, you know, getting the training. He's interested. He's, he's going to pull back in when he can, and, and that will work just fine. So whatever it is, you know, and then the people that you want to work with, don't take yourself out of the game. Say, well, I, there's nothing I can do, particularly in this day and age when we can do so many, so many things virtually and, and, and electronically. So another thing that comes into play here is the local program opportunities. What does the program offer you to where that it would entice you, interest you to get further involved. Do you know all of the different ins and outs? And if not, how do you find out? That would include training. It would include um, not only being, not just being an instructor, but as you all know, how important it is to have victims to work on for the students to work on. When we don't get enough victim volunteers, we end up working on plywood gingerbreads. I'm sorry, but slapping a compression bandage on the arm of a plywood gingerbread is not the same as it is when you've got a live victim there and you're worried about, is the bandage too tight? Have I put it on, you know, is it too loose? What's, you know, and you get some sort of a realistic flesh flexibility thing in there. And you actually have the experience then of dealing with an arm an arm that's maybe limp, or if you have a frisky victim, one that's hollering and thrashing around and really giving you the fits in terms of challenging your ability to deal with the emotion of the moment. What are the local program needs? You know, all uh, so many times at a, at a might be a cert monthly program meeting or something else goes on, you get an email coming in and the program is asking you, Hey, we need people to show up to, um, to do traffic management at a vaccination site that's going on, something we've probably all seen. I'm assuming that I, I think if you, if you signed up for CertCon, we've already set the hook in you. You're, you're a believer and you've, you're probably a player one way or the other. So when the program, when, when the program needs help, are you, are you likely to respond? Um, think, think that through. Have I, have I been passing on opportunities? And if I have, why is that? You know, am I, am I saying one thing, but then my behavior shows something else? And, and this is not in any way to be, you know, I'm not tossing spears and arrows here, but just so that you're honest with yourself and you don't inadvertently wander into commitments that you really wish you weren't there. And then what are the plausible, the reasonable and more likely local and regional issues that you're likely to face in your jurisdiction? Let me give you an example, two examples. Just as the other night when I gave this presentation, tonight also a major portion of the nation is under severe weather watch. Okay, it, flooding, uh, tornadoes and the like. Um, those, if we were in those jurisdictions, if 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 we were talking from from under that shadow tonight, we would be thinking about different things. How could I help? What what services could I render? In the winter time, it's those those of you with four wheel drive that sign up to to as emergency drivers uh, when the when it's snow season. You know, we're thinking ahead of how we might participate. I'll give you another great example. When uh, last hurricane season, I had the opportunity to sign in and follow a Zoom meeting uh, for uh, Anne Arundel County. And they were talking about their hurricane preps. And it was the discussion about, okay, we know how to get ready for a hurricane, but now we've got hurricane and COVID together. And listening, to, and I, I, this, I was just eavesdropping on this conversation. They were thinking about, hey, we've got real flooding that we have to have to worry about as well. So the, to them, it was COVID. It was the high wind damage that we all kind of planned for with, with the hurricane. But then that county being out in Annapolis and, and the, all the coastline there, 
they were realistically applying their experiences with flooding. It was a real wake up call for me about here, here just an hour away or less and, and my fellow certs are, are thinking on a completely different level than I am because they have to, it's appropriate. So that's what I'm saying about, think about the situation of the region of the area that, that you're in. And I'll go back to Fairfax County, one size doesn't fit all. So some people have to worry about airplanes falling out of the sky because that's where they live. Other people, we have flooding issues here that in certain uh, zip codes that we have to be thinking about. So it, it can be very, very customized to where your particular residence workplace uh, might be. Okay, let's get down to it. Possible next steps for the beginner. So if you're coming in at, at the beginner level, and that could be somebody who just graduated from CERT and, and think about, think expansively on this. What, again, what does beginner mean to the other person? Somebody who just graduated, certainly. Somebody who just transferred into your jurisdiction from a different jurisdiction, not just from the capital region, but from the middle of Iowa. You know, they went through a CERT program, but what was the CERT program they went through? You know, what, what, what are the things are the same? What things are different? Are there different protocols that you might use? So the people that transfer in, and then the people who have been inactive for all intent and purpose. They, when they, when they first took the course, they were a, a newlywed. And then they started having kids. Well, we all know what happens there. Then, you know, you've got all those kinds of concerns and then they get older and now you've got to juggle soccer schedules and piano schedules and all the rest of that. Oh, then they get into high school or, or Boy Scouts. And so you're, as a parent, you're, you're all tied, tied up with those kinds of things. All very good, reasonable contributions to the community. And you've made that a priority and now you, but you just don't have time for cert yet. It gets to the point where all the kids are out of the house, they're all in school or, or gone to the four winds. Now you have time to be cert again, and you'd like to do that. We have a number of people in that category. So they want to refresh their skills. They're feeling kind of uncertain. How can we get them back into the mainstream? So one of the things that um, is the number one action measurable thing here is get involved, do something. Now, this is just like when you're joining your new church or you moved into the neighborhood you've taken a new job and you've got boots on the ground now in a new environment, you have, to, you have to play. I mean, you have to put on the uniform and you have to show up. And that's how people get to know who you are and what your skills are and what you bring to the table. So in big letters, I would, I would make that as the number one thing. This is my goal, I'm gonna get involved. And how you define that, that's up to you. An easy place to begin, the mantra, have a plan, build a kit, stay informed. In some, some places it's written, have a plan, build a kit, get involved. For right now, get involved is for this presentation is more meaningful. When you're building your kit, the first thing I'd like you to do, and please, if you're taking notes, write this down. Don't forget your mental toolkit. It's the toolkit that you have with you all the time. It's that it's it's the corner of your brain where you've stored your cert stuff. I'm the most important person here. I'm going to help the most people. I'm going to do the most good for the most people in the shortest amount of time. Did I mention I'm the most important person here? I'm not going to put myself in danger. You know, those kinds of mantras that should be, you know, in our minds, and that's your mental toolkit. Uh, I'll give you an example of that in, in, in just a bit, but things that you absolutely want to remember, you carry it with you all the time, no matter what your social or recreational or business uh, situation might be, that's your mental toolkit. And, and I propose to you that that is the most important toolkit we all have. It's always there with us. Now, 
you can rehearse that toolkit when you're driving, when you're stuck in traffic and you, instead of just being frustrated, think about something, you know, take a look at a unsafe situation that you noticed up ahead. So how do my mantras apply to that? What would I do if, tinkers to ever to chance thing again, what would I, what am I prepared to do right now with what I have in the car right now? How can I be a, a, a participating cert? You're thinking about it ahead of time. And some, some ideas might, you know, might come to mind, something that worth remembering. And, and when you can get to an appropriate place, stopping and writing it down. That's what I mean by, by that mental toolkit. You can go through the physical inventory of, of all your cert gear that you have. Um, what I call the tools and toys. Um, I'm going to be uh, with uh, Denise, who's our um, moderator uh, um, tonight. She and I are going to be at a, at a session uh, coming up this weekend, and there are going to be a couple people there. And I know for a fact, I, I just I believe unquestionably that one of the one of two or three of the and I'm going to say advanced people, my mentors, uh, are going to be there and they're going to pull some toy out of their backpack that I am going to instantaneously lust for. I, I'll probably stop at Home Depot on the way home and get this gadget. It is just going to be so cool. How have I lived this long without it? You know, we've all been there. Um, so for the beginner, how do you sort through what are, what are the reasonable things and what are the... Um, how heavy is this thing? How big is it? Can I carry it? Do I already have something that's just as good in my backpack? You know, it's that constant thing. How, remember when you were a right out of cert graduate, how did you know how much of what to put in your backpack? And if you're like me, the limit came when the backpack was absolutely full. And then I said, hey, I can beat this. I'll just buy a bigger backpack. And then I realized I couldn't lift it anymore. Okay, so how much of what is the right stuff, again, for you, what can you use productively in your backpack? So that's, a, that's something you can start doing right off the top. Observe the various kits and gear of the more, more experienced uh, certs. One of the more common um, uh, ep <coughs> sessions that I see in, my, in, in our Fairfax County neighborhood teams training when they get together is they do, uh, you know, what's in your backpack and they compare notes and they talk about and will test out different things. So people get to see uh, what, what works and what doesn't, what comes more highly re recommended. One of the more obvious, oh, and, and with that then, and so think you can make a list of all the different kinds of kits that we've all heard about in class. So there's a, your cert pack, there's the med kit for your family, a personal hygiene kit, um, special kits for instant uh, for infants, the elderly, uh, pets, um, members of the family who might have special needs. And then there's the bug out bag. And if you're going to be bugging out, then you've got your financial and legal bug out kit that you want to make sure those papers come with you. Um, and if if you're feeling up to it, and, and again, at the beginner level, it's not too early to start developing a, for me, it was a bin. It was one of those great big uh, plastic bins with the snap lids to it. That I started throwing stuff into extra bandages, an extra pair of scissors, um, guidebooks, the, the, the uh, various lists, the how-to lists that, that come out in various forms that you can buy uh, commercially. And then later on, there was a, another bin that I started for a neighborhood command post. Uh, remember the film uh, where, where the tornado has hit, hit a community and the, and the team assembles under the gazebo and, and they start pulling that stuff together. Well, I've got, a, I've got a, a, a bin that I started for that. So going back to the weight and the size and all this stuff that you're collecting, how are you gonna get it to your rendezvous point? How are you going to get it to your uh, meetup and, and, and your command post? For me, I've got two methods. I've got a wheelbarrow that I put into service right away and a relatively clean trash bin that, you know, the type you tilt, 
and uh, it's, it's on wheels. You can load that up and you can drag that behind you. It's a way of uh, moving more stuff uh, to the site. That's not for everybody. I'm throwing out ideas here. You need to customize it to your, your taste, your goals, your lane. How qualified and certified are you to do what? And how, how then are you, do you plan on doing that? Pursue more training. As a beginner, one of the things you want to do, I would say certainly that would include CPR, AED, the keep your first aid card up to date. Stop the bleed class, I think is becoming a, a, a must gotta have. Uh, you know, for so long we were told, we were shown this is a tourniquet, but you can't use it. You know, well, we're out of those things now. Now we've got the stop the bleed class and you are trained and certified to use a tourniquet. Um, one of the things that we've got uh, here in uh, Fairfax County, and I would highly recommend it, it's an orientation course. It's a post basic cert class orientation. It's an hour long. Chuck Luck and his team sit down in, with people in small groups and it's okay, so you know how to put on a bandage, you know how to splint, you know, red, yellow, green, you know, all that stuff. Okay, now we're gonna talk about, in our case, Fairfax County CERT. Here's who, who, here's who does what, here are the names you're gonna hear, here are the personalities. If you're interested in logistics, you know, we take them back through supporting the class um, in order to put the backpacks together and get them in the hands of new students. It's, it's labor intensive, it takes a lot of time. If you'd like to be part of that team, there's a place for you, we can, we can incorporate you into the logistics team. And so, but they go through that for the entire, our entire organization, so that brand new certs know who to call, we give them the phone numbers, the contact points, the emails, whatever it might be, so that they can get involved. Uh, they don't have to wait uh, for, some, for somebody to come ask them. If they're so motivated, then they can reach out and, and touch the, the appropriate person. If, there's, if there are neighborhood teams already um, in place, absolutely recommend that you join the neighborhood team. The neighborhood team needs you. I mean, I think that's, that is probably the most important construct we've got going. Uh, from my own experience, as one CERT graduate in my cul-de-sac, and I live in a cul-de-sac, um, I, you know, I, it, it's a little overwhelming. I've identified a 22 house floor plan, if you will, that I, that I will try and service should anything bad happens. I mean, I've got that pre-planned out. In talking to my neighbors after I was strutting around as a brand new CERT graduate, I said, uh, you know, I just graduated from this great program from the county. They put it on, it's free. It's sponsored, uh, it's, it's oh, the, oversight by FEMA. And that's how we can, what we can do to keep us to, to respond in an emergency, to prepare and respond to an emergency um, until help arrives, until the, until the big red truck gets here, we're not powerless, we can do stuff. And I know how to do that and it's free and you can do it too. And so they said, well, so what's your title? What, what do you call yourself? And I will share with you that I, I named my, my status as, well, my name's Jim. I'm your better than nothing guy. And they kind of rock back on their heels. And, but, but that's the term that I came up with because that's what it is. If you're bleeding out and there's no professional medical person there, I'm better than nothing. And whatever I do is probably going to help the situation if you're willing to let me work on you. Um, it, it, and it has always helped keep me in check and not to get too full of myself and to remind me that I need to stay in my lane of certifications, whatever that might be. So I just, we talked about stop the bleed. I would never dream of putting a tourniquet on anybody until I went through the stop the bleed class. Now I feel comfortable in doing that and I carry the appropriate kits around in both cars. So things like that. Um, 
So join that neighborhood team. If you can get somebody, if you can work with somebody within the sound of your voice, somebody who is wheelbarrow close, that you can meet up and have that rendezvous point, then you're well on your way to making a huge Im uh, impact in your community. And then that goes to networking in every way you can and building an awareness in your community. Uh, emergency preparedness coalition, whatever that means to you. Uh, checking in at the fire station if nobody else has done that, saying, hey, just to let you know, I'm a cert, I've gone through the training, I don't want to ride in the truck and I don't want to pull hoses, but what can I, is there anything I can do to help you? And, and those kinds of things um, that, that you start making a difference right there. If we move on to the intermediate cert, at this point in my mind, the intermediate cert is focusing on the neighborhood and the community. This is a person that would be working um, using social media, uh, homeowners association, uh, working with the building association in an, in an apartment or a condo complex, uh, reaching out to the building supervisor who probably knows everything about every emergency uh, system in, in, in your building. Um, you're taking a more advanced, a more um, a broader view, uh, thinking more outside the box. Certainly you want to be uh, continuing with your CCE, your CERT continuing education, taking more, more classes, particularly classes that you think are gonna benefit you, that you see how you're gonna use them. You wanna be a force in your neighborhood team. Uh, if you don't have a team, you can, you can create one. Uh, get a download from your um, county CERT manager, whoever it is that, that manages your program for the, for the county. Uh, get a download of people by zip code, perhaps. Start with that, uh, narrow it down. And just pick up the phone and start calling people, you know? I see that you were a cert, you graduated from class such and such. I'm a cert too. I was thinking that maybe we'd get together, you know, put our minds together, come up with some objectives, you know, what's of interest to you? What do you think our biggest threats are? It, it's that kind of a conversation. It's just grassroots networking. And if there is a team in, in place, uh, this is a good place then to say, Hey, you know, I'm brand new to the program, but my background is in telecommunications. I might be able to help you with, you know, and then put out whatever it is that, that you think you can help with. Offer your skills, be as specific as you can. Uh, one, of our, um, one of our leaders uh, for years around here uh, had a great mantra. She said, there's so many different facets to CERT. There's room for you to follow your passion. And I, I always like that. But I mean, so often we get in an organization and we, we have to do this and we have to do that. But here's, a, here's an opportunity where you get to pick what you really like to do and put your energy into that. And it's not out of the question. And I found this on a couple of different, uh, different times. If, if you're passionate about it, chances are you're gonna be leading it. I mean, you get to write the program, the protocols, You'll end up be doing it and you'll be leading that effort. I think one of the more important things that a, an intermediate, uh, someone who's been around the block once or twice can do is mentor the new certs. I would love to, if we had a policy that every new cert was taken under somebody's wing uh, so that they don't, they're not left to have to sign up for that basic orientation course, for example. That, there, that someone can pick up the phone and call you. And this is, again, someone who just graduated, someone who's come moving in from a different jurisdiction, or somebody who is reactivating themselves who's been away from CERT for a while. Um, it's kind of like uh, someone to go to a, a training opportunity with, someone to go to your regular programmatic meeting uh, and to be introduced around. I, We've all been there before at one time or another, we've all been the new kid on the block. It's a hollow, empty feeling. It's a little uh, frightening sometimes to, to have a mentor is there's just no substitute for that. 
I think you can, you can working through your community, again, through the social network, through a community newsletter, uh, alert people to different things they, they can do in their community to work with fire and rescue or with OEM, things like adopt a hydrant, you know, a simple thing, uh, but someone who's gonna take charge of a fire hydrant in the community uh, for heavy snows, there's gonna be somebody there that uh, your fire station knows is gonna dig out that fire hydrant, mark it perhaps in some way, whatever the program recommends, uh, and save five, you know, three to five minutes when the truck pulls up getting to that fire hydrant and getting the hose attached to it. If it's my house that's on fire, those are a pretty important three minutes. And so those are little things, but the realistic things. I think participating in CERT activities, um, whatever they might be, again, going back to what the first or second slide, get involved, whatever that means to you, however you can do it, get involved. Your name comes up, you get name recognition, face recognition, um, and, and it, it, it helps break the ice for the, the old timers, I'll say, you know, you, you, which you are becoming. You, you just wanna, because you're the next generation of programmatic leader. You may not choose to accept it, but that real is realistically what you are, and I and I would encourage you to think along those lines. Um, all of us at one time or another have a big idea. I I shudder to think that there's anybody in the sound of my voice tonight that has not been part of a discussion that goes something like, "Boy, this is so screwed up. What we ought to be doing is, you know, and and having a better idea." If you have that better idea, and there are tons of better ideas out there, I know uh, that we ought to hear about them. You know, the people that are running the program need to hear about them. Uh, and one size doesn't fit all. So just because the other size side of your county is doing things one way, that doesn't mean that's the best thing for your team on your side of the county. So maybe you you introduce an alternative for the appropriate reasons. And you alert everybody to that, hey, this, this would work better. So you've got your, those of us with boots on the ground and involved at the, at the worker bee level, you, you know where the holes are, you know where the opportunities are for improvement. So at the intermediate cert level then, I really, really encourage you to work to own some part of the program. You don't have to run it. You don't have to be in charge, but you've got some niche that you've carved out that you, you think that you can do it better than somebody else. <clears throat> and we all know that there are not people lined up four deep to, to take the different jobs that, that have to be done. We all know that. So if um, I'm going to hit you with, with the last slide that will kind of capture this, but, but we all have to step forward and apply our best skills, our best uh, instincts to make this, make our programs as good as they can be. At the risk of, of treading through a minefield and talking to advanced certs, because, because of this, by virtue of the fact that they've been around, um, they have more tree rings than, than maybe the others. What is it that the advanced cert could be, I'm gonna say should be doing, but certainly could be, I think leading by example is, is absolutely the top thing there. Uh, you've been around, people look to the advanced cert, uh, whether you want, want to be or not, if people, people are looking to you for the example um, and helping define the culture of your program. What does that mean? Um, well, it depends on you and it depends on the program, but I would suggest that the culture of a cert program would be um, certainly respecting everybody, uh, starting with the new certs, the brand new certs, the brand new certs when they are in class, reassuring them that they are something special, that they've given up their time and energy and effort to be participating in this cert group. And that, you know, after tonight's class, when we talk about med one, and I look at you and I start talking about a green victim or a yellow victim, 
I, I, you are a colleague. I expect you to know what that is. And I expect that you're going to uh, take the appropriate action. You're gonna know that red is, is more immediate than, than, uh, than green. And, and have them buy into the program, have them understand that their participation, that their knowledge, that their skills are valued in the community, starting with their fellow certs. So uh, that would be one. In, in Fairfax County, I'm gonna be so bold as to suggest that humor is a organizational cultural element. Um, I know that when I get together for, I guess, I guess the way I think about it is in, in, for me, insert, there's a time to be deadly serious. And when we've, tra we train to those times and virtually everything else, there's a place for humor. And the, the people, my colleagues in insert are funny. They're fun. I look forward to getting together with them. I, I enjoy trading barbs with them, uh, people who are, who are self-effacing and who can make fun of themselves um, while totally supporting the program. But, but that would be an example of the cultural things that you think are important. You wanna set that example and you want to help set the standards for your program. Remember everybody, all of us are volunteers here. We're, we're not getting paid to be here. So you wanna make it as enjoyable and as friendly and as fraternal as we possibly can to get the most out of people, to get people coming back as frequently as, as we can have them. Um, so in your mentorship, you know, uh, that we're, we were talking about earlier, you're the one that should be looking at the new talent. You know, as these new people show up, gee, that <clears throat> there was, uh, during COVID, we had to modify how we were teaching basic cert. And we took some different types of people. And of course, there were fewer assistants there uh, assisting in the class. There was one woman in particular who just stood out right from the very beginning. And there were probably about three people who went up to her and said, you know, there's really a place for you in, in this cert. Um, here's, here's my number. Give me a call. We can, we can find a place for you. Well, now she's, she's one of the lead deputies to our to our volunteer lead. I mean, it happened just that quick, but she was able to distinguish herself very, very quickly. So we need to be on the lookout for those folks. Um, ask people for their presentation, just like we did with this one lady. Hey, we really need you and these skills. One of the key uh, relatively new people that is uh, behind all the scenes of CertCon 2021 and is in this making this uh, virtual presentation happen. You'll never see her. Very, very new, but an expert in, in this field and someone who could read through the contract material and all the applications and all the programmatic stuff to make this happen. And she's just been great. Once again, us people at my level and of my class, class type would not, would not have been able to do this. So besides mentoring then, I think one of the things, uh, other things to do is to take the time to train your trainers. You know, that's part of setting the culture in your program. What do you expect from people? What are the standards that you would like them, like them to follow? And what do you do in order to train them so that they can do that well? So that's been kind of a quick and dirty. You've left a little bit of time here for questions. Uh, not just questions, but your ideas about what did I forget to mention? What's one of the things that maybe you thought of that you'd, you'd, you'd like to share? If you can put that in through the chat system, then we'll ask uh, Denise to alert us to that. Well, you had one from the very beginning. Um, okay. One about the ball players. Back to that, that um, little story you told. And the question was, did the players use statistics i.e. likelihood of base hits or infield grounders? I, I'm, I'm way out on a limb here, but here's from what I, and I'm, 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 I'm not a big statistical person in baseball, but I love old baseball stories. And this even goes back to, you know, the Ken Burns series on baseball. My guess is that these people did not use statistics. From what I see and hear, these were hard drinking, tobacco spitting, 
uh, guys who were good at baseball and probably, and, and this was their niche in life. This, this was a hard bunch. And so I doubt that they, they certainly didn't use printouts. Um, I think they just knew from experience that McGillicuddy, when he came to the plate with the man on first and third, that he was going to try and pull the ball no matter what happened. So uh, it was just probably usage more than anything else. Um, so that's not a, that's not a an authoritative answer by any stretch. I think it was just when you've been around in, in your office, when you've been around often enough, you know that the deputy for such and such is always going to respond in a certain way, and 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 we kind of set our set the, set things up accordingly. Um, that if, was quite a question, though. I got to answer it. Was great. <laughs> if and when you have folks who stop participating after going through basic training, do you reach out to see why they lost interest? Yes, and I we use our team. Uh, it's nice having Denise on here because she's the deputy team neighborhood team coordinator um, for Fairfax County, and we absolutely do. Um, when we have people dropping out for a number of different reasons, there's a rule of thumb, and I don't know where this came from, and I don't know if it's statistically valid or not, but the it's almost a mantra that after five years, people get tired of cert and they go put themselves on the shelf. Um, and I think that happens for a number of different reasons. One of the things that we all have to be aware of is everybody in their personal lives, the lives are evolving. So um, if you get to a point where, you know, the kids are out of the house, um, you as a couple, you've got lots of spare time, free time to start pursuing the things that you'd like to do. Just around the corner then comes elder care. So you think you're out of the woods, but now you have your parents to take care of. Things like that. Or there's a move, one of, one of, the, one of the, or the other of the couple is relocated for, or changes jobs. Uh, gets promoted into a more demanding job. Things are always changing. Uh, and some people, when they finish basic cert, they identify themselves and want to sign up with the team. And then they just kind of figure out for themselves, you know, this really is not my cup of tea. I am content to shelter in place. I've got my stuff here. I've got my bag. I've, I've got a couple of go kits that I put together. Uh, I've got some water in the basement. I've you know, I put some food away so I can shelter in place for a week or so. And that's what I want to do with CERT. And, and we honor that and we say, that's okay. You know, we, we, I make sure that, that my people, my team members know that I'm interested in them, that I am, um, do, am available to do what, whatever I can for them, that they, they can count on me to forward notes of minutes and to announce new people that have come in and that sort of stuff. Uh, but they, they've let me know, many of them, that they sort of want to be like Minutemen. They're, they're there if something bad happens in the neighborhood, but I really don't have time for this training, more training right now, excuse me. So I try and honor that and treat each one individually. And until they tell me to take, take them off of my uh, call list, or my email list when, I, when I'm forwarding materials. Until they tell me that they'd like to be taken off that, I keep pushing the material out to them. So you got a comment. I really like the situational practice to keep you sharp and active. This method is something I will definitely use. Good, I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you one more example um, on that, something that I do. It'll be a quiet Saturday afternoon or midweek, it doesn't matter. Um, and I say, gee, you know, the grass is cut, that this is done and that's done. I really, I, I know I'm gonna do a drill. So I just felt the earth shaking. You just had another earthquake from down Lake Anaway. Um, I, I feel it was probably pretty serious. It shook the plates off of the, you know, the, the table. Um, this is a drill. So I look at my watch and I say, okay, Jim, what are you going to do? So I start moving. I actually 
go get my backpack, drag it out. I drag out. Uh, the, well, the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll check with, with the spouse and, and call members of the family to see if they're okay. And, and so I get that, that thing checked off. And then I do a, an internal search of the house. I check faucets. I make sure that I don't have any broken pipes, running water, that sort of thing. Nothing seemed to have fallen. Anything that broke, it broke. Well, that, that's okay. But there's no fire. There's no flooding. All right. That, my house is safe. So I say, I'm going to go out now and I'm going to do, a, 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 I'm going to get out on my front porch and I'm going to look up and down the street. What do I see? How bad is this? And I, I create a situation. I imagine what I might be seeing. So I create a level of, of threat, if you will. And it's worthwhile then to say, okay, this is a cert moment. I'm going to self-activate. I'm going to get my gear and I'm going to go to the rendezvous point. Get out the wheelbarrow. I get out my backpack. I throw some water in there. I throw a tarp or two in there. Things, I put my bin in there, my neighborhood CP bin. And I actually, like a geek, I go down, my, <laughs> down with my wheelbarrow and all my gear. And people know what I'm doing. I, I've done this often enough. They say, oh, they're old crazy Jim again, you know? And I go down the pipe stem and I get to a little tree that's halfway down the pipe stem. That's my stop tree because my failing is I always run into things and I, I'm gonna fix it. I'm here and I'm gonna fix it. No, I, that's my stop thing. And the, this is my situational awareness tree. And I stop and I put the wheel wheelbarrow down and I go through the mantras. I go through the checklist in my mind. What do I think I'm gonna find? What's, what are the dangers? Okay, we don't have overhead power lines. I don't have to worry about that. Probably maybe some broken, Look for some broken pipelines, some flooding, sewage, that kind of stuff. Okay, all right, take a deep breath. Okay, now I go to my rendezvous point. And that's how I practice responding in my neighborhood. And I will tell you that every time I do it, I find that I have forgotten something or I botched something, I did it wrong, or I could have done it better every time. So that's how I practice and how I encourage my team members to do it because it personalizes it. It is absolutely not the way you would do it, but um, it's, it's the way I practice. And so what I would leave you with is ask yourself the question. See, it's the old thing, and you've probably run into this before. If not me, who? And if not now, when? If there's something that could be improved in the program and I don't bring it up, who's going to do that? For most of you probably, you know that your program leaders are already too busy. If you want something additionally done, you're gonna need to step up and, and help at, at probably write, write the protocol for it and maybe take the lead on it. And there's no time like the present. Af, of course, after CertCon, when you're no longer looking at presentations. If you have any questions or you'd like to provide feedback or uh, I've got templates. So if you've got something on a, on a particular thing that you'd like to talk about or ask for help on, I'd be more than happy to respond to you. Um, we're five minutes over now, and I don't want to keep you any later than, than you've already volunteered to be here. Thank you very much for your attention, your time, and your questions, and good luck out there with your programs. There was one other question, actually, but it's a whole class. So it's a uh... What do you have in your go kit? And I think we have a class on, uh, I know CERT, Fairfax County CERT does. What, what's in your pack? So. Um, yes, Fairfax County does. And I, and I think all the jurisdictions probably do. And it would be too long to get in here. I will tell you this. My backpack has been getting smaller and lighter. Because when I really stop and think, for, and this is for Jim McFeeders now. When I stop and think about the difference that I'm probably really going to make in an emergency and um, the things that are time critical, um, because we live in counties that are so well resourced um, and, and particularly Fairfax County where uh, we have a, a, a very dense population and we have a lot of fire and rescue assets in 3940 stations, it, they're only going to be five, 10 minutes away at the most. Um, 
what I think that I'm going to be called upon. So I, I did my situational awareness, you know, my, my evaluation. And I, I came to the conclusion that, yes, I can do CPR in, in a normal emergency. I'll be able to sustain CPR for the five to 10 minutes until somebody more qualified can get there and help out. That was a big, that was a big relief to me because I was worried about being in a position where it, it might be necessary to do this for a half hour. And I always questioned whether I could do that for a half hour. The second thing that, that, that comes out of, of all this is the, the two things that I can bring to the table right away is that, that are probably gonna be really uh, important for me to do. One is to give some direction. So assume leadership, give direction, have somebody call 911. And you know anybody who can volunteer, come over here, please, to my left. You know, do that sort of thing. Call for help. Get people, start getting people organized, and most importantly, staunch the bleed. If somebody's in shock, I, you know, if it's that bad and that quick, I, I may not have time to take care of them. And if they're not breathing, we know what you know, what that's about. But bleeding is probably the thing that I'm going to be challenged with more than anything else. Once again, this is Jim McFeeders talking to you about what I've come up with with my plan based upon what I think my lane is. So I, I'm going to, I am prepared and have thought about all the different, whether I have my pack with me or not, how can I staunch the bleed and save a life that way? I think that's where I can have maybe the most logical, plausible impact on somebody in a bad situation. And once I get that, then I can have somebody else, you know, put pressure on that and I can go to the next person. So that's how I think about it. But uh, so my backpack, you might imagine, is very, very bandage heavy. Um, not a whole lot of tools. I, God help the worn pillowcase in this house that's going in the backpack one way or the other. It, it just became a bandage. So that, but that's how I think about it. And that's what I would encourage you to do. Know where you are in the program and what you think you can do and then what you plan to do. Uh, that's, that is sort of the, that would, what a great question to end the, end the session on. Thank you for that. And thank you all for being certs. The life you saved may be mine.